Hey, 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 good morning, good morning. What's up, you guys? Hopefully we got some folks out there. Um, welcome, welcome to Saturday Breakaway with your girl. I'm your host, Julian Alexis, the founder of Campaign P31, a platform for women like you who are chosen and set apart. And I am super pumped. Y'all see, this is what we do on Saturday mornings. We just kind of like wake up. Saturdays, I believe, are designed for sweatshirts. Anybody believe in the chat out there? I mean, come on. Saturdays are designed for sweatshirts. So typically, I wear all the things I don't wear during the week. Um, I'm kind of formal, even though I work um, from the crib and I'm at meetings all day. I'm pretty pretty uh, non-casual. I would say that I dress to impress. Um, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, I got some kind of blazer on. It's California casual, so you know you got to kind of take that into consideration. But I'm super excited to um, um, have you guys here. If this is your very first time, you didn't rock with us last weekend, then I just want to welcome you again. This is a safe space, you guys. This is the place where you come and you hang out with your girl on a Saturday morning. Um, and we do the thing called Bible study. It's a safe space for new believers. It is also a space for those who are in transition from one space to another um, and just don't want to fall in between the cracks. So you can come and find connection uh, with other women like yourself here in this space. You can find accountability and community. And you can also, more than, and most importantly, have communion with God. And so I'm so excited to invite you into this space. Um, really interesting thing about this is that we are trying something totally new and that we are using YouTube to, um, post and hold all of our videos, but we are actually making them private so that you can feel free to comment as you will, um, in this space. And so when you jump in, you are able to jump in and see what's going on from the inside out. So you can, some of you are actually in the room with me and then others of you are actually, um, hanging out with us live over on YouTube because you have a private link. It's posted private. So um, if you are unable to catch this in real time, you will see the replay as long as you are part of our insiders list. So that's a plug. Yes, it is. If you are not currently on our insiders list, I want you to go over to campaignb31.com and I want you to sign up under the breakaway landing page, which is under courses. All right, you guys. So this is not a course, this is Bible study. So we kind of relax in here. We're chilling. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited. I am over in the corner today. Yesterday I, or last week, I was over near the bookshelf in the library. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. I don't know if y'all saw the plug for this, but we had this whole conversation about world's best gummy bears and how we can be locked and lo loaded into loyalty and proximity more so than what God's best is for us. And so I just challenge my ladies, anyone who's out there to make sure you're vibing with the father and that you are going after everything that he has for you, uh, which is his very, very best. Okay. So today we are, um, let's just kind of like talk a little bit about what breakaway is for those who are the first timers, um, just to kind of um, get them started. Basically, I just came off of a very long hiatus, but before I went on the hiatus, the father was already telling me, um, Alexis, it's time for you to kind of move and create some space. And so he started clearing my plate and all these different things. And what I thought would be like maybe a couple of weeks or maybe a month at most ended up being like three months, if not more. I, I thought that we were going to start breakaway in August. I literally planned for August 1st and I was talking about it in June and it didn't happen. Um, and it wasn't because I didn't do all the things. It was because the Lord said, I need you to go on a break. I'm going to take you away. I want to I talk to you about this breakaway concept, but he was revealing parts of it to me as I was being obedient to things that he was kind of nudging me to do. And so it ended up going through August, September, and October. And we just finished October. And so I just broke my silence October 28th. And it feels weird to be talking in front of a camera again. I mean, I have to be honest, it's been a while. <laughs> and so I, you know, I'm going to be me regardless. I'm going to do the thing. I'm going to say what God says. And 
I'm going to be obedient um, at all costs. And I had to tell the team last week, I was like, hey, listen, I'm not concerned about followers and or the algorithm or being a slave to any of that. Um, my master is Jesus. When he says, lean with it, I say, rock with it. Let's go. When he moves, I move just like that. In the words of Tim Ross, when he said that last night, I don't know if y'all watched his live, but it was phenomenal. If you haven't done it, go ahead and do it. You need to just put that on your to-do list for this Saturday. Um, but that's something I used to say all the time. And I still say to kids, um, sometimes if I'm in a space and I know that they'll respond to that. Um, so when I move, you move just like that. Let's do it. And so that's how the father had me on this break. And so, um, but then we talked about last week, what does that look like in a practical sense and where is it modeled in the Bible? And we looked at Jesus, the life of Jesus and his ministry. And oftentimes the father would call him to come steal away with him just from little one-on-one uh, -on -one time. And so oftentimes there were six different areas that we saw that Jesus broke away um, to have more intimate time with the father. Was one, when he was preparing to make a major decision or preparing to do a major task. I'm sorry. That's the first one. The second one, he's trying to recharge after doing some really hard work. Um, and then we see um, whenever he had to work through seasons of grief, he went away, specifically on boats. And I, <laughs> I put my two cents in about how when my mom passed, my husband take us on a cruise. And something about being away on the water in this boat with no phone reception, it really did a thing. Um, and then we always talk about before making important decisions. I think that one's kind of obvious. But then the last one that Jesus shows us is that um, in times of distress, we see him in the Mount of Olives. I'm a, is that it? The garden? Yep, that's Mount of Olives. Um, right before he's crucified, he is in distress. He is stressed out. He is overwhelmed with all that he has to accomplish because his um, earthly body and mind doesn't want to do what his heavenly task has been assigned. Or that uh, They don't want to fulfill the heavenly task that's been assigned to him. And um, the last thing is when you just need to gain you need to gain focus. Um, you need clarity. You've been working in a fog and you need to get out of it. Um, the father says he invites us to steal away with him. And it is always some precious time. So I'm inviting you um, in like manner to Saturday Breakaways, which is our Bible study here. So welcome again. Um, and today we're going to talk about um, midwifing an escape plan sounds weird, right? But we're really going to focus in on midwives. Okay. And so in the midwife situation, um, I um, wanted to start our conversation, oddly enough, um, with just kind of the study of midwives and what they do and how they actually um, were kind of brought to be or what their task was. Typically, um, in the Bible, midwives, um, they were the ones who had this occupation of helping people bear children because they had no children. So I think that's the first thing to stop and think about. It's a woman who could not have a child is helping other women who can have children have children. And this week I had a conversation with a good girlfriend. And one of the things she said is that seems kind of cruel. It seems sort of strange to believe and think that if somehow God has you in a position where you can't birth your own thing, that he would put you in position to help someone else birth theirs. Seems mean. And at first sight, the answer, I would agree. I, you know, in my own humanity and my own feelings, yes, I would agree. And in scripture, we're going to go through a couple of passages where we see the midwives popping up and there are some really integral intersections of critical things that are happening, both in terms of loyalty and proximity, like where they are positioned. And I just think, I think it's unique and I think it's interesting, but I'm sure God is looking down on his story from a, you know, 50,000 um, foot view. And he's saying, think it not strange, daughter, that I would actually weave this thing into your storyline so that you can understand 
that if you're not currently in a position where you're birthing something, you are helping or you are to help someone else birth their thing. So um, I want to kind of just talk about that. I want to make some sense of that. What does it mean to... Um, for spiritual midwives to have the ability to assist the birthing of something, whether it be from concept to reality, to assist the entrance of this brainchild into existence. What does that mean? What does that look like? Who are those people? How do you know? Is it okay to be vulnerable in those spaces? And some of those questions we will answer today, and some of those questions I believe will be um, unpacked for you as you continue to walk with the Holy Spirit this week in devotion time. I believe he will shine a light on where you are and what you can expect to do um, as a midwife or um, receiving assistance from a midwife. Both are some really critical positions. Um if I have to be honest, you know, thinking about this made me reflect on the time in the season of my life where I was having my own children. And I thought about what that meant for me from a spiritual perspective. And I hope during this time I'm able to kind of shine a light and unpack it. But I'm also allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me in this conversation. So just for a moment, I want to say a, a little um, prayer. God, just be with us. Help us as we um, desire to know more about you through your character the character of your words that are um, inspired and written here in the Bible. And we just ask and pray that you would illuminate what your thoughts and plans are for us so that we might walk in accordance and obedience to it. In Jesus name. Amen. All right. So I'm really excited. The first scripture I want to take you to is um, Genesis 35, 16 through 19. Um, and it is... Um, quickly, I have it in my spiral notebook. If you guys don't have a spiral Bible, oh my God, I'm not making a plug for them. I don't get paid by them, but I want you to know the spiral Bible is life giving. The ability to write in a Bible like a spiral notebook is something special, y'all. I'm trying to tell you. So um, we're in Genesis 35, verse 16 through 19, and it reads like this. This is right after, just to kind of give you context, this is right after Jacob has wrestled with the Lord, all right? And he gets up and he calls that space Bethel. Jacob called, so I'm going to read verse 15 just so you can hear that. And Jacob called the name of this place where God spake or spoke with him, Bethel. In verse 16, it says, and they journeyed from Bethel and they were but a little way, um, uh, a little way to come to Ethereth. And Rachel travailed and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And then it came to pass as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, and his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ethrath, which is Bethlehem. And so what I think is particularly ironic and very detailed is two things that stand out to me in this passage of scripture. Number one, the midwife there, they don't name her. They don't, she doesn't seem to have a very important role, except for she is aware that this labor is very intense and it is one that is more intense than normal. That's why she noted that she travailed and that she had a hard labor. And then it, it says it twice just to reiterate the thought and as she is noticing this, she has the ability and she is in proximity to Rachel to be able to speak words of encouragement in this really tough time where it seems like all is lost and it's bleak and her life is fading fast. She speaks a word of encouragement and she says, fear not for thou shalt have this son also. 
telling her that you will have the promise, this prized possession as well, that you will have the thing that you wanted before and then the thing that you want now. And that spoke to me. That was good. That was good um, marrow to my bones. I think another thing it talks about or demonstrates the faithfulness of God, even in bleak situations, that just like he did it before, he will do it again now in this time. You can expect it. It's going to come through. The sad part of this is that Rachel does indeed die, but not before she sees the promise. I mean, isn't that what we're all looking for? That we will see the, um, the, the goodness of God in the land of the living? Isn't that what we all desire? Um, but even if he doesn't, <laughs> even if he doesn't in the spirit of Daniel, that our God is faithful, true, and he is good regardless of how he comes through or the timing by which he comes through for us, whether it's on this side or in glory, he is a still faithful God. Um, the last thing that I thought was super, super, so it speaks to the loyalty of God to us as humans and men, um, but also... Um, his faithfulness through and through. But the other part that's secondarily really interesting to me was where she ended up, where they buried her on the way to Ethrath. And Ethrath is actually Bethlehem. Now, y'all all know the coincidence in that, that Bethlehem is the city by which Jesus is born. Y'all know. So this is kind of like leading us slowly toward the way and painting the picture and the road for the Messiah. And we're only in Genesis. Like they keep hanging out in these townships, in these areas. And one person is connected to the next person that's connected to the next person. Um, I think it's also interesting to look at the lineage of um, Jacob and understand who he came from. Okay. Um, taking note of that is super important. Um, I think later... One of the things it says to me also about this midwife, and this is a note that I placed in my Bible, it says that midwives hold dreams of others. They are watching you push this thing out. In this case, it's a child, but she's the one that catches it. She's holding the dreams of others because they are unable to produce their own. And my question for those who are listening is, have you been a midwife who has had to hold on to the dreams of others and hold it safely in your hands. You are the one who are who is sitting close enough to see and know and understand all the ins and outs, the proclivities, the problems, the solutions. You are the back side of a very um, polished plan. And you've had to hold the dream in your hand. Even though the thing that you're holding is the thing that you also simultaneously dream of. That's a hard position to be in. You've got to love the process enough to know that one day um, that you too will be able to experience sitting in a different seat. They also spoke life into dark, hopeless situations as she shared a word of encouragement with this um, young woman. Um, it just seems very sad too, because we know the story of Jacob and Rachel. We know how um, this all came to be at the very beginning. If you have not um, heard the story, Jacob worked for Leah. He had two wives, Leah and Jake, I'm um, sorry, Leah and Rachel. Um, and just his love for her was so um, immense to, lead, to lose her this way. I can just imagine how heartbreaking it must have been. But the other thing about the midwives that stands out to me is this, um, that midwives have seen it all. You got to think, you did this job every day of your life for a while. So you've seen it all. There's not much that would surprise you or that you haven't experienced or that you wouldn't be prepared for. So as a midwife, you know that, you know, having a baby, things happen, and but you become experienced at it so much so that you kind of know if this happens, then this is how you respond. And if this thing happens, then this is how you respond, right? 
But then that experience is not just good for the person who is having the child or uh, developing the dream or pushing forward um, in whatever uh, thing that they are going after, chasing after. But it's also equally good for you. So for when the day comes where you switch from being a midwife into the one who needs the assistance of a midwife, as you lay on the table and you birth your own dreams and you birth your own children and you birth your own future and you birth your own book or your own podcast and your own platform or whatever it is that the Lord has assigned to you, as you sit in the position to be able to birth that thing out, you will reflect on the time where you were a midwife and you learned from being up close and personal with everyone else's experience, holding their dreams in your hands, that then you would be able to take that experience and apply it to your own situation. In that season, also with the help of a midwife. And I think that's what gets really, really, really interesting to me. I think God in his sovereign ability to be able to be a God who orchestrates your present while simultaneously linking your past to your future, it is remarkable, to say the least. Remarkable. Another passage of scripture I want to point out to you is found in Genesis, a couple of chapters over Genesis 38, um, verses 27 through 30. And um, interesting, yet again, the midwife pops up, a different midwife pops up in this story. It would, wouldn't it be interesting if this was the same midwife? She was just going from place to place. If we knew her name and could capture her story, I think we're hearing her story through other people. But it would just be really, really interesting to find out if this is the same person. Um, but I don't think that it is. Here we are, 27, it reads, and it came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her room. Here is a, a season of double blessing, a season of breakthrough, um, where twins were in her room and it came to pass that as she travailed, the one put his hand or put out his hand and the midwife was there and paying close attention the Bible doesn't say this. This is me adding words here. Let me read the scripture first and then I'll go back and give you um, the Julian Alexis version, J-A-V. Okay. So it goes like this. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put his hand out and the midwife took and bound his hand with a scarlet thread saying, this came out first. And it came to pass as he drew his hand, as he drew back, his hand that behold his brother came out and she said how has thou broken forth this breach be upon thee therefore his name was called Pharis and afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand and his name was called Zerath Zerah Zerah yeah Interesting, right? And of course, you know, because I'm churchy, uh, the first scripture that pops in my head when I hear this situation is, well, you know, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, right? I mean, I could help it. I mean, if you're there, hey, hey, Alexa, I see you. I see you. Um, but yeah, I could not help but think that. But the truth of the matter is, um, that's not actually accurate. Yes and no. OK, but one thing I did see that I thought was um, interesting in terms of midwives is, number one, she was very observant, observant enough to notice that, hey, we got twins here. So this is why this season of travailing um, seems a little bit harder for this young woman um, who I believe is Tamar, which is this whole story. If you have never read the story of Tamar, y'all. And this ain't Tamar Braxton, but I'm talking about Tamar. If you need to read this story and find out what happened with this lady, there's a lot going on here. But one thing that I thought was really interesting is that this midwife noticed, number one, that the, the blessing of this moment was double. And because of it, it's a double weight. It is a double hardship. 
it seems to take longer. She had to be alert. She had to be aware and watching very carefully. And because of that, she did this thing that she knew to do was we want to know who came out first because there is a birthright that's associated with whoever is born first of these two things. There are benefits to knowing who came first and who came second. So she understood that in order to get it right, I need to tie some type of signal or symbol onto the first child. So she tied a red thread, scarlet thread is what it says. But then the child drew back their hand, back into the womb. Came, like went out, it came out. <laughs> Can you picture this? And then it went back in. And then the first child, the actual first baby that came out was not the child with the red thread on his hand, but it was the other brother. Then she even, she's talking to the babies as they are arriving. She's talking to the situation as it is happening. And she's saying, how is it that you came out first? Because of it, here is your name. She names them accordingly. Now, because this is a Bible study, I normally wouldn't do this, but because it's a Bible study and I didn't actually do this ahead of time, I'm kind of curious and I hope that you are too. What does the name Ferris mean? And it's spelled P-H-A-R-Z, um, R-E-Z, Ferris meaning. Let's see what it says. Um, It means she knows. Ferris means she knows. Let's see what Zara means. Zara. Not like your favorite clothing store because this one has an H in it. It's emerging from the Arabic and it means a blooming flower. Also means the bump. Okay. The bump. Interesting. The first one she knows, I'm wondering if there's a biblical meaning for Zara. Huh. The biblical meaning for Zara, oh, hold on. East, brightness. East or brightness. And then again, I'm I'm sorry, I think I did that incorrectly for that first name. Ferris means, this is what you can do in Bible study that you can't do on regular stuff. Um, Ferris means, oh, it has no results. When it says she knows, that was actually the name of the site. I wonder, I'm going to do some more research on that. And when I find out, I'm going to let y'all know and I'll put it in the chat or in the comments. But I don't want um, to get too lost in that. But I, I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, but she was there. She was alert. She was right with it. Um, and one of the notes that I wrote for myself in this moment was that the midwife was there to take record, to keep record of what was happening, the rights and the wrongs, what was righteous and what was fair. So then later, when the questions arise about which child um, should be assigned a certain benefit. The midwife of that moment, the ones who are taking, they're the note takers. They are the recorders. They are the ones to say, this is how it went from the historical perspective. And this is what needs to be done. They are the ones who kind of determine what's right, what's wrong, what's fair. And then people are left to their own devices to figure out how they will execute that stuff. So yeah, midwives. The last passage of scripture that I want to take you to is one of my favorites. I'm not going to lie. Um, so we're going to go to Exodus chapter one. And this is where we get into our thoughts for today in terms of midwifing your escape plan. And I think God um, is so gracious to us in many ways that he allows us to um, see glimpses of what it is he's concocting, like what it is he's doing, even though we don't see the whole picture, he'll give us a little a briefing. 
And what we now know in retrospect, having read the Bible and looking back at the stories, we now know that the birth of this one particular child that I'm about to describe is the checkmate. It is the escape plan for the children of Israel out of Egypt. And there was a midwife there who helped make it happen. She was given an assignment by the Pharaoh of the time. And she, as the person who holds the dream, um, the dream bearer in that moment makes critical decisions. So I'm going to read it to you and I hope um, you can follow along. It's in Exodus chapter one, verses 15 through 21. And it goes like this. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was, um, I think it's, oh, I don't know how to say that. So I'm not going to pretend, but um, I'm going to try. It looks like Sephara and the the name of the other was Pua. So Sephara is S-H-I-P-H-R-A-H. And the name of Pua is P-U-A-H. Okay, so I'm going to go and, you know, do some more research and play that and see if that sounds right. That's probably the American way to say it. Don't quote me. Um, But at the same time, these two ladies, and he says to them when they go, I'm sorry, when they do the office of the midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him, is what Pharaoh says, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and he said to them, why have you ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwife said upon Pharaoh, unto Pharaoh, um, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and they are delivered ere the midwives come into them. So ere, as in like before the midwives have come into them. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed mightily. Verse 21, and it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. And so of course I was like, made them houses. Like these women are helping to birth children. They don't want houses. They want a baby. They are here having to work and help women have babies because they can't have one of their own. They don't want houses. So what does this mean? God, why are you giving them houses? They want babies. (laughs) And the truth of the matter is, is that The people, oh, it says in, oh, I regret this. It says that what happened is when he, God favored them, he says that, um, God's blessing was on the midwives. He enabled them to have children of their own because of what they did. These two midwives were gifted with the ability to birth their own thing because they were faithful and doing not just the job that they had, but doing it to the glory of God, doing the God thing in the midst of the job thing that they were doing. Y'all got to catch that, that they were blessed beyond measure for doing the God thing in the middle of the work thing that they were already assigned to do. Not only did they choose to do their job, but they chose to do it well and they feared God in the way that they did their job. And so I thought that thing was so good to me that they feared God in the process of doing the job that they were assigned to do. And because of it, he blessed them with their own children. He blessed them to be able to birth their own dream. That blessed me. 
I don't know who's on the other side of this, but I can only tell you from my perspective because the Lord always deals with me first before I am able to share with anyone else. But if you have ever sat in the seat where you have been the organizer, you have been the planner, you have been the logistics person, you have been the strategist, you have been um, the person who figures out the behind the scenes for everyone else, you have been the coach and the cheerleader and the figure it out person. You have been the go-to brains behind so many different things. If you've ever been that person, what I want you to know is that God is not forgotten about you, number one. And when you decide to do that thing, not just do it well, but do it and fear God in the midst of doing it to the glory of God in excellence to God, then it won't be long, just like these two midwives, that you will see that God is setting you up and he is midwifing your escape plan. These two ladies were so intricate in making sure that when Moses' mother had Moses, that not only did she have him quickly, but they saved his life. Moses' mom was able to put him in a basket and float him down what is probably the Nile, and he floats into Pharaoh's house. And in his own house, he feeds, teaches, grooms, raises, develops, educates the escape plan in his own home. The escape plan that God has set up and ordained and assigned for these people to come through and become free. All because two women stood as midwives in the, in, during a moment of a gate. That it was a gateway for the men, the Hebrew boys, to be saved. It was a moment. So my question to you is, what are you birthing right now? What are you preparing? What are you working on? Whatever it is, it is your escape plan from Egypt. Egypt is not just a place, but it's a mindset. Egypt could not only just be a place. It had to be this way of normalized thinking um, that we sometimes settle for, but God is calling you to greater greater than anything you can imagine that you can create or you can think it's greater for you. Sometimes he has to call you out of a space in a place in a time in a season to be able to do something that only you would only do for him in obedience to him in order to help write your story to get you closer out of loyalty, out of proximity to the old and into the new. And then he says this to us whenever we are willing to um, relocate and follow his way and follow his direction. Said He says, hey, look, one thing I want you to remember, Galatians 5 and 1, he was like, it's for freedom's sake that Christ has set you free. So don't be bound. So stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. That's one thought. Now, granted, that's New Testament. We are distinctly in the Old Testament right now. But separate from that, he also says in Isaiah, which is Old Testament, he says, look, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing something new. Even now it is coming. Those women and those babies started coming. You can't stop what's coming. All you can do is either get help or help yourself by pushing. Because you're going to have to travail through the thing. Don't you see it? Don't you see it is what he says. Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. What are you doing to prepare? I think about a mother as she's preparing to go into birth. There's this season where they call it like it's nesting, right? There's that, but it's not just the nesting stuff, but it's the preparation. She actually has to prepare her body too. Like, you have to, you know, sometimes you have to do a little extra exercise and you have to stretch in ways that you didn't have to stretch before because you're preparing for something. You're preparing to birth something. You're preparing to birth a dream. What are you building? What are you writing? What are you 
Um, who are you meeting with? How are you saving? How are you stewarding your money? How are you cleaning up your credit? How are you preparing for the thing that either you're going to be a midwife to or the thing that you are actually going to birth? One or two ways. Because if you are currently a midwife, then you're helping the person who's currently pushing. And for those who are currently pushing, maybe it's been because, or maybe it is because they have already been in a season of midwifing. So I think it's really, really interesting that God kind of revealed this to me. So I, you know, I've been hearing a lot. Who are your people who are around you, who support you, who help you to birth the dream? both in the natural and in the spirit. Who are those midwives? They are helping you to write an escape plan, an escape from the mindset where you've been stuck, an escape from um, whatever your Egypt is. It's not just a job. It's not just a place. It's not just people. It is a space where you have normalized um, this type of thinking that I can't do anything greater. Who are the midwives? I love it so much. The last week I heard a sermon that kind of reminded me of the story of the paralytic man whose four friends carry him in. And in that case, not that they were giving a birthing analogy, but they were giving a, who are your road dogs analogy? Who are those people who are ride or die and who have insight, experience, and who can help you navigate a situation beyond limitations and beyond problems. They saw the problem. The house was full. They saw that problem. They dealt with that problem. They attacked it. They said, let's go up these stairs, go to this roof. But then it gets to the roof and they thought maybe, you know, my, maybe they thought it was going to be a sunroof up there. I don't know. Or a light, you know, what do they call a little, I don't know, a light box or whatever. Maybe they thought it was going to be easy, but then they had to make another decision while they, when they got there, like we got to tear this man's roof up. Otherwise our friend is not going to get what he came for. Whew. Don't you need some friends who will help get you to the place, not get deterred by the obstacles along the way, and then make sure that you get what you came for. Don't you need some friends like that? I mean, I do. I mean, and when you look back, and you see, he only needed four. Four. So the question to me, I mean, the question to you from me is this. Can you identify those four people? Who are your midwives? And what plan of escape are you writing? That's what I want you to think about this week. Either you are the midwife and you're helping someone else escape the idea of poverty or generational curses over their lives or building a brand or dreaming a dream and making it go from concept to reality? Are you a midwife or are you in a position where you need to connect to someone who is a midwife? So here's the other part about the person who needs to connect. When you are in a pushing, when you are in a pushing season, you cannot be picky about who helps you. <laughs> Not like that. You are looking for relief. I'm saying that as someone who has had two children. You are looking for relief, but you're also looking for skill level. You are looking for someone to be able to assist you who is skillful in what they do. I remember, I think it was, Oh, I don't know if it, I can't remember which kid. I don't know if it was my son or my daughter. But at one point when I was pushing, I do remember that there was one nurse that was not particularly gentle. And I was like, I do not want to have my child while she's on duty. She was very curt with her words and she didn't make me feel comfortable. At, at If anything, she made me feel uptight and anxious. And I was waiting for the shift to change so that the nurse, the next nurse would come and I could then relax because I am in a vulnerable position. I'm in a vulnerable state and I cannot have anyone around me who is volatile or who is rough around the edges when I'm trying to do something so, um, so intimate, so uh, just, it is, it's a moment. 
you got to you you got to have the right people on your team. And when the right people come, you just let them help you. However they got to help you. It don't matter. It's like just help. Just help me tell me what to do, how to do it, what you how do I how do I navigate this season with some relief and some expertise and some shown up Holy Spirit. It brings peace. It brings joy when you are trying to birth this escape plan. Moses is what's being birthed in this moment with these two midwives. Moses is God's escape plan for his children. And these two women, these midwives were phenomenal in helping the Hebrew women of the time, specifically Moses's mother, be able to accomplish that what the Lord has already predestined. Whew. Y'all, even getting this word out to you has been a birthing process. I think about the scripture really often, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, and it says, come to me all ye who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn my ways, learn my experience, learn what I know, hear from me. This is what he's saying to me. This is what I, the way that I hear it. For I am gentle and I am humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. There is a easier way. Midwives in your life or connected to your life or as a midwife to someone else's life is God's easier way. It is the way in which people find rest for their souls. It's one way. It's one way. I also think about the whole idea of not being a slave again from Galatians 5 and 1. Don't be a slave to the old version of you. The one who was standoffish, didn't want to accept help, or the one who wasn't willing to provide help for someone else in their season of need. Don't be a slave to the old way of living, the old ways of traditions and habits. Don't be a slave to old titles. Don't be a slave to old instruction. Don't be a slave to old ways of thinking. He's doing a new thing. I used to get in trouble for saying this sometimes, this statement at at my job, um, because I meant it. But I think it makes so much sense. And when I say it, you'll probably agree. I used to say when it came to different personalities and people and all the kind of things, you're trying to get people to work and do things and and be passionate about the task that they have at hand, whether it be something, a God assignment or an assignment you received on a job, or maybe you're in school right now, or maybe you're writing a book, or maybe you're doing something that is daunting and it seems overwhelming, that it is easier to give birth than it is to resuscitate the dead. See, I live in the city of Inglewood and not too far from my house, there is a cemetery that is full of unrealized potential, but it's gone and it is no longer easy to go over there, find a corpse and try to resuscitate it. But what is easier to do is to birth a new thing. So sometimes you have to let the old thing go in order to birth the new thing. That's all I got to say about that. Why is this important? It's important because we need to understand the needs and the heart of a servant, of one who is currently a midwife. We need to understand their needs, their heart, and the sensitivity to what it means to be in position to want the thing that you're helping to birth, but at the same time having to help birth it. Seems like a a conflict of interest. But the truth of the matter is it is training ground. I remember so much when I wanted to be married and I wasn't married. What I did was I found a way to serve a woman who was married. And I studied 
and I learned from her. And I got close to her and I saw how she moved and how she cared for her children. And I saw how she cooked meals and I saw how she still was um, on top of her professional and career and all the other things. And it gave me insight to how to find balance in my own life in the future. The other reason why this is important is this, if you are a midwife, it is a reassurance that God sees you. And he has a plan for you. The last and most important, or not most important, but another important thought is that for those who are in the position where you actually need assistance, in your sensitive time, your vulnerable moments, um, where the world could really, the world seems to be um, oblivious of what you're going through as you are birthing and you're having birthing pains, um, figuring out um, what this thing, this dream is going to look like at every turn. You have to be sensitive enough to allow people to come alongside and assist you. It might be God sending you a rowboat in the midst of your storm and having you evacuate. It might be them blessing you um, financially in a way that you didn't anticipate. And it kind of makes you feel awkward because it's coming from someone that you probably didn't expect to receive it from. You are in a birthing position. You really can't do much except for receive. Be aware. Be gracious. Be humble. Receive. Um, some things that I just want you to think about, I want you to think about the sensitivity of the heart, what it's like in these vulnerable moments. Are you being honest with yourself? Are you being open with others? And are you being transparent about how you feel in these moments? And if you haven't been, and you've noticed you've pushed people away, or maybe you haven't accepted help, or maybe you haven't been very helpful to others, then I want you to go back. I want you to replay how it's been and I want you to make an action plan of how you're going to change it with a date. I'm a teacher, so you can look at me with that. In the words of PT, you can look at me with that tone of voice if you want to. I know when you're going to do the homework and we're going to brush it off. So I want you to go back. I want you to reflect. I want you to figure out what's what. I want you to come up with an action plan and put a date on it, a due date and do the thing. All right. I love you. I hope that you've enjoyed our time together as we have broken away. I want to open up the floor in case you have any questions. You can drop a question in the chat. Um, I'll see it and I can help you guys out. I'm really excited about all that God is doing. Y'all, this thing is going to catch on fire. So if you haven't already, next week, I definitely want you to share. Um, I'm going to make sure I get the word out earlier. My schedule changed at the last minute, which I kind of had an idea that it would. That's why I didn't post as early because I didn't know what it was going to be like until I got closer to the day. So I apologize for that. But I will be back here on um, live with you next week. This is a private link. So no one can go to YouTube and see it. It's only for those who have registered um, within the insiders list for breakaway. So I can't wait for the moment where we actually go live on Zoom and then on YouTube at the same time. God has already kind of like shared some things with me. So I can't wait for that to happen. I want you to make sure that you have a seat because in the room, there are only so many seats. They are the VIP seats um, in this space with me in Restream. But those of you who are watching me from YouTube land, you guys get to see all of the deal. Um, and hopefully one day we'll be able to have like two different pods, like the one where the insiders see all the goods and then we clean it up and make it nice, short and sweet for those who are out in YouTube land. Um, and so they can just get a little bit too. Um, I want to let you know that, um, if you are currently looking for community, this is a space for you. It's a fluid space. It's not a space where we contain you here, but you come in when you need it and you leave out when you don't. And it's okay. We just want to welcome you and to have communion with God, connection with others, and um, accountability and community. So if that sounds good to you, uh, make sure you follow us on IG, YouTube, 
Facebook and uh, Campaign P31. Just stay tuned. We got lots of stuff going on. This is Saturday Breakaway and I'm your host, Julian Alexis. And it's been my pleasure to serve you today. I love you and I'll see you soon. All right. Bye.